These banks are what I call zombie banks. That is, they have negative net worth. The only way that uh, executives and shareholders can come out, out of it really well is if they go out and take big gambles and they pay off. And if those gambles don't pay off, it'll be on us, the taxpayers, to pay for it. So that has to be regulated. They're going to be put in a straitjacket. So we are going to have, you know, we don't see it immediately, but we're going to have over the next few months, the next several years, a much more regulated banking system. Now, could you explain a little bit more what you mean by the phrase zombie banks? Uh, it's just a bank where if you marked all of its assets and liabilities to market, or if you just said, all right, today, you just have to sell all your assets and pay off your depositors, you know, liquidate the bank. Uh, if you tried to liquidate the bank, you would not end up uh, with any any equi anything left for the shareholders and executives. So this, and I call it, a, it's called a zombie. It's not really my term. It goes back to the savings and loan crisis. When the savings and loans were given the opportunity to keep going, even though that they were they were insolvent, they went nuts. They bought junk bonds, they bought commercial real estate. And as uh, one economist pointed out, what, what, what the zombie banks would, savings and loans would do is they would pay higher interest rates because they were so desperate to kind of you know, keep gambling and they would buy weaker, uh, invest in weaker loans. And what does that do to a, a healthy bank or savings and loan well now their you know their ability to compete has gone away so these zombies are really dangerous and that's why uh, there will be ju justifiably very tight regulations as we speak the fed is the most bankrupt bank in the country you know they're they're not going to collapse they can always take more money from the treasury but that is just that's just the reality they they are in the position of svb in terms of you know the market value of their portfolio um so i think you know when you go so you know i think the process by which svb went down is as i described it when you talk about blame then you have to talk about who could have done differently and you know, a lot of people would say, I, I think this is really strange, but a lot of people would say that the uh, venture-backed um, firms should have behaved differently. They'll say, well, they shouldn't have put, you know, $5 million in deposit at this one bank. They should have spread their deposits around. They shouldn't have put the money in. And I've also heard the op sort of the opposite, which is they shouldn't have all taken their money out uh, a couple of weeks ago, they should have left it in. So they sh shouldn't have put as much in when they thought the bank was solvent and they shouldn't have taken as much out when they thought the bank was in trouble. So that's, you know, okay. It, it's tr probably true that if they hadn't done those things, we wouldn't have had this bank run, but that kind of blame, I don't fit. The blame that I think I'm inclined to do is to go all the way back to that deficit spending and the quantitative easing. Uh, there you're really putting the whole country at risk. There's no, you know, it did, it does not end well. It, it leads to the inflation. The inflation leads to the high interest rates. The high interest rates bankrupt a bunch of companies, including a huge portion of the banking system. I think there's something like still $600 billion of embedded losses in, the, in all the banks and only about $2 trillion in equity. So they've lost about a third of their equity. Um, so all that I trace back to the loose deficit spending and the quantitative easing. All of this raises questions about what we call moral hazard. And that's a question that um, uh, Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, former President Harvard um, said is not something to worry about uh, at, at this, or, you know, he said in the lead up to the bailout of the depositors that it's not really a question that uh, can be front of mind for regulators. Don't think this is a time for 
moral hazard lectures or for talk about teaching people uh, lessons. We have enough strains and challenges uh, in the economy without adding the collateral consequences of uh, a breakdown in an important sector. Larry's my age. He remembers the savings and loan crisis, and he knows what moral hazard is. But he also knows that you know this is this is an emergency. Hmm. That if you if you let the uh, if you stick with the two hundred fifty thousand dollar ceiling, obviously a lot of tech firms get wiped out, and you know. I don't feel like they deserved it, and I don't think it. I think it would have been horrible for all of the the people who worked for them. It you know, cause cause all sorts of chaos. Uh, and on top of that, you have all these other banks where you know everyone can you know can look at their financial statements and see that you know a certain percentage of them are underwater, not as badly as SVB, but they are underwater. And so you'll have bank runs all over the place, total chaos in the financial system. So, yeah, to worry, you worry about moral hazard tomorrow, not today. I don't think Larry would say you never worry about moral hazard. And I think he knows you're creating a ton of moral hazard. And my point about zombie banks is that they are the ones who, the owners there are the ones who have lots of moral hazard, especially now that all their deposits are guaranteed. If they're underwater, they have nothing to lose by taking money to Las Vegas and betting, and they have everything to gain. And the only thing that stops them from doing that is regulation. And that means that the regulation is going to be tighter. And I think that that is going to last forever. There's this basic trend that government financial policy, whether it's monetary policy, whether it's regulatory policy, it all the policies that survive are the policies that allow government to allocate credit to its preferred uses, especially to its own spending. You know, as far as more hazard goes, I mean, at least the um, shareholders were not bailed out, right? So there was no, you know, there's still risk from investing in a poorly managed bank. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as far as depositors go, most indicators show that they would have gotten like 80 cents back on their dollar um, if that were allowed to to play out. Um, you know, so it's not, I don't think it's a moral case that those depositors had to be bailed out, but I, from their perspective of preventing future bank runs in an emergency, I can see why they wanted to do it. Yeah. But like, you know, most moral hazard decisions are, are kind of that trend of fix the problem now uh, and then address the moral hazard later and then never really address the moral hazard um, either because they just don't or because it's, it's you know, they've kind of created a, a situation that we can't really address it. Um, and so I, I, you know, I think that's a, just a general trend that just keeps happening. You know, there's a lot of talk about abandoning any effort to fight inflation. I think, and I think John Cochran would think that any effort to fight inflation has to include a serious effort at reigning in the deficit. And not just any one year, but all the out years. And that includes Social Security and Medicare. Are we going to see that? Probably not. So does that mean we're going to relive the 1970s with a lot of floundering and you know, random policy changes that don't do anything and you get a lot more inflation? So uh, anyway, it's it's not an easy thing to answer. I just say that the one precedent that comes to my mind says watch out for you know lots more inflation and, and more troubles and just to be very clear about that wh why is it that bringing the deficit and eventually the debt under control is the essential component there from your viewpoint because ultimately that's what you know how the government injects money or wealth into the economy is by just running these deficits and if you don't and and you know how do you how do you get rid of government debt you can def formally default you just say wake up tomorrow and say sorry bondholders you're not getting anything no. or you can actually cut spending raise taxes or you can inflate it away there's no sentiment to formally default there's no sentiment to 
bring the deficit under control. So what you're left with, it seems to me, is inflation. Hey, thanks for watching that excerpt from my conversation with Lynn Alden and Arnold Kling about the Silicon Valley bank meltdown and what caused it, who's to blame, what to expect next for the U.S. banking sector. Uh, you can watch the full conversation by clicking here or on the link in the description below and subscribe to Reason TV and watch these conversations live every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern.